Forget it. Let's go. Make a light change in case it comes out. Go down to eight. All right. Five. Get ready. Six. Let's go. Oh, shit. Go ahead. Roll Let's it. Go, go fellas. Here, here comes the Get the boat on. Get him going. Cut. Well, we had eight people in the picture. There's a truck. You print that. It was very good. Jerry, is the camera here safe? I've got speed from Jordy here, and I've got speed from Connie over on the fourth camera. And then I would say action. I always have a terrible feeling yeah. in this office. This is only what? a rehearsal. It's something. <laughs> Somebody didn't oh. get the message. And... <laughs> Well, I said to George once, I said that no matter how much I screwed up or no matter how manly he screws up, I think the picture will survive because the material is so good. And I believe that. I think it's one of the best pieces of material, period. Not the treatment of it, just these two, just these two people. The story is on a, on a sheer gut narrative level, it's a terrific, it's a very, they, what they did is an interesting story. What the picture works off entirely is the, is the relationship between the two guys. If that washes, if one enjoys being in the presence of the two men, if any warmth between the two men comes over on screen, then you're going to go with it. If not, there's no picture. There are different kinds of leaders. Some lead because they're more aggressive, some because they're smarter, some just by the force of their personalities. I don't know exactly how he did it, but he led and controlled the most vicious gang in the West at that time, and still he remained the most affable and good-natured outlaw in frontier history. Everybody liked him, even the Pinkerton men. When I first got involved with the project, I thought Paul should play Butch, but most everybody else thought he should play Sundance, including Dick Zanuck. Uh, the trouble was that a lot of people were thinking of Butch as a kind of a, a funny man, a comic uh, character. I saw him as a warm, open, uh, amiable guy, and that's exactly what Newman is. I kept Butch very loose. There are some characters that you keep tight. I mean, you have a very tight rein on it. I, for instance, I kept Cool Hand Luke very loose. I kept the Hustler very tight. I cut the hug very tight, but I, I thought for Butch I wasn't going to make any judgments about it and, and just use a good deal of myself in the part. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Wrap it up. Now hold it, boys. One thing. Sundance was Butch's opposite in almost every way. He was a deadly killer, a man of uh, sudden violences and uh, titanic drunks. He had no friends, really, except Butch. And the extraordinary thing was the closeness of their friendship and the fact that it lasted all their lives. I wanted Bob on the picture from the beginning. He's a tremendous acting talent. He's also a very independent, uh, hard-nosed Mick who goes pretty much his own way. These were qualities that worked very well for Sundance, including a genuine warmth under a very cool exterior. There was a reason why he was the fastest gun in the West at that time, because he used his guns a lot. He's a loop. He's a loner. Somewhat sullen. And um, to the outsider, he is a very distant kind of guy, maybe even a bit schizoid. I was interested in more than anything in the relationship between the two guys. I thought it was unique, fun, good. You see a lot more warmth. Actors can sometimes be a terrible pain in the ass with their jealousy of each other. But on this one, even though they didn't know each other before they started, uh, Bob and Paul consciously established a relationship that was excellent. It included Redford's having to laugh at all of Newman's god-awful jokes, and Newman had to put up with Redford showing up anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes late all the time. But to have that kind of relationship off-screen is damned important because it'll show up on-screen as well. Sundance, when we're done, if he's dead, you're welcome to stay. <clears throat> Listen, I don't mean to be a sore loser, but uh, when it's done, if I'm dead, kill him. Love to. The first day of shooting was on September 16, 1968, on a narrow gauge railway that runs between Durango and Silverton, Colorado. We picked this narrow gauge railway because it was a period train that was actually operating. 
We had to shoot this sequence out of continuity because we were worried about snow. The train made this trip high up in the mountains where the snow can begin anywhere from the end of September on, so we had to do this scene first. Uh, there are a lot of pressures on you on the first week. You've just arrived, as we did here, with 165 people. You're very aware that you're spending anywhere from 30 to $35,000 a day. The crew doesn't know each other particularly well, and everybody's a little bit nervous and out to prove themselves. If you're not careful, the whole thrust that first week can be to see how many setups you can get uh, to prove to the moguls back at the studio that it's going to be a smooth operation. I try to avoid that trap by scheduling my first week's work very loosely, uh, giving myself a normal half week's work to accomplish in one. Uh, but even then, I usually fuck up my first week's work anyway before I get into the swing of things. Uh, Pre-production rehearsal periods are very important, I think. Uh, before we started shooting this scene in Durango, we'd already rehearsed for two weeks back at Fox. Uh, still on that first day shooting, Paul reacted in an odd way. During the rehearsal, he'd been very relaxed and very easy as Butch. Uh, but when he started this scene outside the baggage car, he began doing things he'd never done before. He seemed for the first time to start playing it uh, like a comic. Uh, he seemed to, to lose confidence in his whole rehearsal approach. In that particular scene, uh, Bill writes with shut-off speeches, in other words, cut speeches. Well, the reason the speech is cut is because another character interrupts him. What that does is that imposes a rhythm on the actor. In other words, the scene propels the actor rather than the actor controlling or propelling the, 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 the pace of the scene. And I couldn't understand what the hell was happening. There was a lot of discussion those first days as to whether this was a comedy or not. Actually, I don't think there's any difference between directing for comedy or directing for tragedy. I think the director and the actors have to go for the truth, uh, the reality of a situation, and make it believable. If Paul Newman is in a funny situation and we believe him, we'll laugh. If he's in a tragic situation and we believe him, we'll cry. You don't play funny or play sad. You play real. Of the three principal characters we were dealing with, the least is known about at a place. There's only one picture of her that we know about, and that was taken with Sundance at De Young's in New York when they went through there on their way to Bolivia. Uh, there are some stories that she was a school teacher, and that's the way Bill has it, but I think probably she was one of the prostitutes from Fanny Porter's house in Fort Worth. Girls are a problem in Westerns because they slow up the action. And while I was working on the picture, we were always talking about that whenever you brought the girl in, make sure that things didn't come to a terrible stop because that's a tendency in Westerns. I mean, any action picture, the girl is a bore. In some ways, Catherine was miscast for the part. Uh, the real Edda probably had more mileage on her and was a good bit tougher. Uh, but Catherine has other great qualities going for her. She has an enormous appeal on the screen. Uh, she's cute, she's sexy as hell, and she projects a kind of a vulnerability that's very endearing. We shot Edda's first scene at Grafton, Utah, just outside Zion National Park. It was actually a deserted Mormon community with a, uh, an abandoned adobe church, which we converted into a schoolhouse. In fact, the only house we actually constructed ourselves was this little place for Edda. We had it built so we could shoot outside as well as inside for the moment when Butch rides around the house. You are mine as a place. Mine. You hear me? Mine. All mine. The raindrops keep falling on my head. And just like the guy whose feet are too big for his bed, nothing seems to fit. Though. Raindrops are falling on my head, they keep falling So I just did me some talking to the sun And I said I didn't like the way he got things done Sleeping on the job When Bill and I were working on the script, we decided on three separate musical sequences in the movie. Uh, one of the reasons for them was that Edda didn't have that much footage in the picture, 
and we wanted to create scenes without dialogue over which we could play music and just let uh, Catherine and Paul or, or Catherine and Bob improvise their scenes. Uh, Catherine does that very well and very easily. In fact, I think uh, the musical sequences project her character and her relationship with the guys as well, if not better, than the dialogue sequences. <laughs> When I wanted a bull for this sequence, they shipped me one all the way from Hollywood out to Utah just for this one shot. This particular bull's name was Bill. He was supposed to charge after Newman, after Newman crashed through the fence, or at least after, the, uh, after Newman's double crashed through the fence and Paul took his place on the ground. Well, Bill was a friendly type bull, and in order to make him charge, they had a, had a little flit gun that they loaded with something uh, called High Life. And when I'd give the cue, they'd squirt it on poor old Bill's balls and he'd take off in whatever direction he happened to be headed. I don't know what kind of Hollywood training uh, actually was necessary for that. Uh, maybe Bill's forte was that he just didn't turn ugly afterwards. He, uh, he kept coming back for more without any noticeable uh, change in, in disposition. The bike sequence also provided our cinematographer, Connie Hall, with a chance to improvise. Before I started work on the film, I ran close to 50 Western movies all the way from uh, William S. Hart to the present day. And of the outdoor photography in the recent ones, I thought the best was done by Connie. He's a wild motor or a speed motor on it. I consulted him a great deal on the film. He went along with me on my final location scouting trips uh, both in the United States and in Mexico, and together we picked locations where uh, not only I could stage well, but he could get his best photographic effects. I wanted a kind of washed out, desaturated color to the film, and Connie achieved this by a couple of devices. First, he overexposed the film as much as uh, two or three stops. He also liked, whenever possible, to shoot with backlight, and dust and smoke, Christ, we had dust and smoke in front of every shot conceivable. I like that effect. I've always thought it was much sexier to see a naked woman half-veiled than to stare at her ass dead on, and Connie felt that way about obscuring photographic images. Well, that's correct, because it's reflex. And on the other camera... You we tried to shoot through things at the actors, and uh, sometimes the actors objected in a pretty unsubtle way. No. no. I see. Now, are they all Mitchell cameras? I'm a grandmother! Every once in a while you run across a scene you really don't like, and that's the way I felt about the one where Bob grabs the fat lady and Butch imitates her voice. Now, the trouble with it was it just seemed phony. I couldn't really believe that Butch could imitate her voice well enough to fool Woodcock, even though I planned to help that later in the looping by switching to Paul's voice halfway through her prayer. Thy kingdom come. Uh, anyway, we shot it, and people seem to think it was funny as hell, but I don't like the damn thing, and I never will. How high is this explosion going to go up? Oh, I'd say maybe 75 feet. Will, will the blast knock them down? Well, it'll make them back up. For the scene when Butch blows up the baggage car, we had to build it out of balsa wood, so our stuntmen who stood in front of it wouldn't get too badly banged up. No, it hit 75 feet. We had a very good dynamite man on the show. He was very accurate as to safe ranges of operation, and he could place these guys where they wouldn't get hurt. Jerry, is a camera here? We constructed bunkers for the closest cameras. Uh, actually, we had four cameras on the shot, and we cranked them at varying speeds. The Mark II, the Mark II. No, the Mark II here. The Gottschalk there. The Gottschalk there. It was a shot high on the Volkswagen. You have to over-crank an explosion, otherwise it'll be too fast on film. A normal speed is 24 frames, so we overcranked the main camera at 64. As a matter of fact, we had different speeds on all of the cameras. Uh, we didn't want to take this shot over again. I'll get speed from Ed in the bunker, and I'll get speed from Connie over on the fourth camera. And then I will say action. Well, that ought to do it.
Think you's enough dynamite there, Bush? In the movie, immediately after the explosion, the money from the safe is supposed to be floating through the air, and we had to match the floating money on each one of our subsequent cuts. Uh, we had a huge Ritter fan uh, concealed here behind the other side of the train, and we kept feeding fake money into it to blow it up into the air for those shots. It takes a lot of time to get the smoke pots and the floating <laughs> money and the actors all coordinated for each shot, and individual matching <laughs> takes like this can prove uh, very costly. <laughs> For the arrival of the super posse, we had to build a special car for the horses to jump out of. Uh, it's three feet higher than normal, so the guys riding the horses wouldn't get decapitated on the jump out. Also, the only way the horses could get a dynamic bursting out of the car would be if they had a little run at it. So we built this ramp on the far side of the car, and we opened up both doors so the horses could run up the ramp on one side and out through the open door on the other. It was a dangerous shot and cost us over $1,000 per jump for the stunt riders to do it. So we had several cameras for each jump, so we wouldn't have to do it too often. Uh, we shot it, of course, so you don't see the open door on the other side, and it just looks as if they're pouring out of a closed box car. Whatever they're selling, I don't want it. One of the fascinating things about Butch was that while most Western heroes deal in confrontations and showdowns, he spent his whole life trying to avoid them. The smartest thing he ever did was to clear out of the country when he saw civilization catching up with him. Most of the other outlaws of that period stuck around to get hunted down and killed. Uh, Goldman had a feeling that we might run into a little trouble here. Because the movie audience is used to the hero in a western being able to do the impossible. And so you say, it's only six guys, why doesn't John Wayne shoot them all? Or why doesn't Paul Newman shoot them all? Well, the fact is that Paul Newman can't shoot them all, and if he tried to shoot them all, they'd kill him. Paul and I had a disagreement about the shooting of the posse. And that is the proximity and the identification of the posse. I felt that, that, that the posse should be nothing more than ever a presence. We would shoot on a wide angle lens to give it distance rather than a long focal lens because then the character is right on top of you. How many were following us? All of them. All of them? What's the matter with those guys? I preferred using the long lens because that way I was able to get the feeling of distance and still keep them close enough to be menacing. Uh, we used a 500 millimeter zoom to get that effect. Damn it! Uh, we shot the very end of the chase along the Animus River Gorge in Durango. Well, the way I figure it, we can either fight or give. If we give, we go to jail. No, we'll jump. Like hell we will. We shot the scene there up to the actual jump itself, but the water at that location wasn't deep enough for our two stuntmen to jump into. So we constructed a platform just off the edge of the cliff, and Paul and Bob jumped on it at the end of their scene. We had to go back to Los Angeles for the actual jump, which was done several months later. We went out to the Fox Ranch at Malibu, and we put our two stuntmen up on top of the 70-foot train. We stirred up the water with a dozen outboard motors to simulate the rapids. Bill Abbott, who's the head of Fox's special photographic effects department, had this glass painted to look like the cliffs around Durango. He set up the camera to shoot the stuntmen through the glass and pan them down to where they hit the water. Here are two stuntmen jump off the crane at Malibu. Uh, you'll notice they're going across the screen left to right. This is how that shot looked in production after it was photographed through the glass, flopped to change direction, and cut into the end of Paul and Bob's scene. The 
trip they made through New York on the way to Bolivia became one of our three musical sequences. Originally, it was to be done in live action like the bike sequence, and I wanted to shoot it at the Fox studio where they'd built a magnificent New York street for Hello, Dolly. But since our release date was before Dolly, Zanuck didn't want us showing the street to the public before Dolly did. So I decided instead to make the sequence out of old still photographs of New York during the late 1890s. Uh, we took still pictures of our stars at various spots on the Dolly Street. Then we cut them out and we pasted them into old photographs so they would actually seem to be a part of the period pictures themselves. We printed the whole sequence in sepia to give it the same kind of period flavor as the opening of the movie. Uh, we worked out all these moves for an animation stand, and we shot them one frame at a time. We shot most of our Bolivian sequences in Talayacop in Mexico, about 30 miles south of Cuernavaca. In colonial days, it was a main stop on the stagecoach run between Acapulco and Mexico City, but now it was mostly a farming community. The first scene we shot there was a sequence where Edda teaches the guy Spanish. Catherine had very decided opinions on how to play her part. She's a very intelligent girl, but I didn't always agree with her. Actually, my communication with her was the least good uh, of any of the actors, and it led at times to uncomfortable moments on the set. But ultimately, if an actor or an actress has talent and a strong set of convictions and persuasion can't move them, uh, sometimes it's better just to back off and go with them uh, rather than create a situation where neither one of you gets what you want. Of course, in the final analysis, the director's working relationship with the actors is terribly important in the making of any film. I have a feeling that George probably directs with a much tighter hand uh, than he did on this picture. I think he kept a fairly loose one. Just as I kept very loose, uh, I thought George was terribly rigid when, I first, when we first started rehearsing. And yet, as... Uh, the days of rehearsal went on, <clears throat> I realized that he really had points to make. They may have been in opposition to whatever viewpoint I had about certain areas of the script. So, uh, we tangled, but it was uh, with some affection and mutual respect, and uh, that's always the way it should be. One of the smartest men I've ever worked for. But uh, the things I like him most for are his perversity. He's a fighter, and I think there are too few fighters left. And uh, unless you have a few fighters around, why, well, there are going to be nothing but compromises. You can't just casually win a point with him because of his, because of his blind ego. You have to be prepared to substantiate any, anything you might say that challenges what, what he does. He's strong enough to uh, say you are right. Whereas he doesn't let his pride or his ego stand in the way of his merit. He heard Paul out, he heard me out, through his own suggestions, and then he made his decision about which way to go. Certainly on this film, there was a freedom of exchange that was unusual for me, at least. Uh, Paul likes to say that the best film experiences are community experiences, and uh, even though I'm not sure that's always true, in this case it was. Bob and Paul, besides being uh, enormously skillful actors, are also extremely bright guys and very knowledgeable in all areas of filmmaking. And they made uh, very real contributions, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> Da 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 da
The Bolivian bank robbing montage was the third of our musical interludes. Actually, we have less than 12 minutes of music in the whole picture. I don't like scoring dialogue scenes, and we didn't, except in one instance of the campfire scene when Edda leaves. All of the rest of the music in the picture was in these musical sequences. Isn't that a pretty sight? Well, we're back in business, boys and girls, just like the old days. Bert Bacharach uh, scored the film, and we made a deliberate decision to go with a semi-modern sound, despite the fact that we were playing in period. Uh, the picture was designed for a contemporary feel. The characters are modern uh, rather than traditional in approach and temperament. And Bill's dialogue, uh, where it isn't actually anachronistic, has a very contemporary rhythm and sound to it, and we didn't want a traditional Western score. Location. We had a hell of a time finding the location for the bloodbath sequence. We finally found this spot just outside Tepet's land. It suited my staging needs okay, but Connie didn't like it because it was in pretty flat light most of the time. And on top of that, the mountains cast deep shadows in the morning and evening, so our shooting time was cut down. Occasionally, a director can fuck himself up by reaching for an unusual effect at the expense of a scene. My original concept for the bloodbath scene was quite a lot different from the way it turned out. Low motion camera, four times normal, under crank camera. The point of the whole scene, of course, is the effect that the massacre has on the guys, and particularly on Butch, and the ironic fact that in going straight, he's had to kill, uh, which is something he never had to do as an outlaw. And to, and to ghost out the... I wanted to achieve a very special effect in the killing. I wanted to have the bandits hit and fall in a series of uh, overlapping images in which they'd seem to be falling out of themselves. I got that effect by lining up two cameras on the same angle, over-cranking one and under-cranking the other. And when I had them all put together optically, it was really a fantastic effect, but unfortunately, it was utterly wrong for the scene. It became uh, balletic and beautiful, but not in the least horrifying. Uh, since basically, I think a director's obligation is to make a scene work and not his effects, I threw it out and just used the slow motion dying. I wasn't particularly happy with that just by itself because it's become a cliche to shoot death in that manner, but at least it made the point of the scene better than the more spectacular version and I had no choice. Most of the time I go into a sequence knowing generally what I want in staging and setups, but uh, still keeping as fluid as possible. But in a complicated action sequence, uh, such as our shootout here in the end, I think you have to work it out very specifically in action and camera angles, or you'll get hopelessly messed up in the cutting room later on. I spent the Sunday before we shot this scene out on the location along with our second unit director, Mickey Moore, and our art director, Phil Jeffries, planning the staging and the camera angles shot for shot. As we worked our way through it, I also wrote down the cutting pattern I planned to use later in the editing room, and Phil drew out a visual continuity guide for uh, camera position and, and for moves. The actual historical location where Butch and Sundance shot it out with the Bolivian cavalry was a much more confined location than the one we actually picked here. Uh, you can't follow the script very closely when you come to an action situation like this. Uh, you have to invent your activities to take advantage of the location you've got. In this case, in order to give our guys some cover on their dash across the courtyard, we turned this little square into a marketplace and we put these stalls all around the sides uh, so we could give uh, Paul and, and Bob some place to dive and to take cover. When the actors came on the set the first day of shooting the scene, we went through the entire sequence and discussed the action. A uh, rehearsal period on this kind of scene can take anywhere from three to four hours or, or more, uh, making sure that the actors and your key men know exactly where you're all going. But even within the context of a, a specifically laid out scene, such as this one, 
You try to keep as loose as possible. If you have really inventive actors like Bob and Paul, uh, they often can come up with an idea that's better than yours, or at least can trigger you onto something else. And you've got to keep yourself in a position to take advantage of it. At the same time, practically speaking, I personally have got to have the security of a blueprint of the scene in my pocket, uh, because having a whole crew standing around at the rate of close to $5,000 an hour while you're doing your homework on the set is a kind of a luxury that uh, pictures just can't afford anymore. Another thing about Paul and Bob that I've almost never run across with major stars before was their willingness, uh, actually their eagerness, to come in and rehearse on their days off. We did that on many occasions throughout the film so that we wouldn't waste valuable crew time while we were working out our scenes. But on this kind of an action situation, the crew has to be there to plan the special effects details as, as you go along. In any sequence involving guns, of course, you've got to rig the hits. Uh, our special effects man here is, is wiring the table for the first bullet hit. He's drilled a hole in it, he's stuck a charge in it, and uh, he's wired it to his battery. And his assistant has another set of wires running from the battery to his fingertips. In the scene, the guys sit down at the table to get served their dinners, and on cue, he sets off the charge with one hand and fires the gun with the other. For the bullet hits on the walls, alongside them on close shots, we sometimes put explosives in the wall itself. But mostly we use these air guns fired by special effects crew off camera. They can fire blood pellets and dust pellets, and you obviously save a lot of time with them rather than setting individual charges. They're amazingly accurate. A difficult and dangerous part of this sequence was getting Paul riding between the horse and the mule across the square. Stars doing their own stunt work is all right up to a point, but it's always risky to let them get into really dangerous physical situations, because if they get hurt, the whole production might have to shut down, waiting for them to get patched up and back to work. But in this case, we had to get some close-ups of him riding between them, and he did them for us. For the wider shots, we were able to use Jimmy Arnett, uh, Paul's stunt double. To get the mule to fall, we used a technique that's illegal in the United States called a flying W. The mule's front feet are wired and the wires run up through the saddle and out back. The mule gets up a good run and the wrangler jerks the wires and pulls his front feet out from under him and he goes over on his face. Uh, there's a chance of breaking the animal's neck in this technique, but fortunately we didn't. Gunfights in westerns are always phony because the heroes shoot endlessly without reloading. So in laying out this sequence, I incorporated several definite times when Bob actually had to stop and reload before he went on, and I made a special point of them. I wanted the audience to accept the fact that we were being absolutely realistic, because actually for the dramatic effect of this final burst of firing, I wanted to take the license of letting him continue to fire without reloading, so long as it was dramatically effective. Actually, in our final cut, I've never counted the number of shots he takes after his last reloading, but it must be close to 15, 18 times. Jimmy Arnett, Paul's stunt double, was the corregidor on top of the arch shooting at Bob. On this particular take, he took too long to fall, but I wasn't quick enough to cut and to stop him before he went. He took the fall onto a stack of cardboard boxes concealed behind that wall, but they weren't strong enough to break the fall and he went through them onto the cobblestones and fractured his pelvis. Uh, it took him almost three months to get back working again.
The final scene between Paul and Bob was a tremendous acting challenge. In the dialogue itself, there is no reference to the fact that they've been terribly wounded, uh, that they're in pain or anything except their usual bantering relationship. Out of context, the scene could just be comedic in result, uh, but in context, it had a whole other meaning. Which says, you know, I, it's a great, I don't want to hear it. Okay. Uh, Paul and Bob's playing of that scene and finding the right balance of pain and humor and hope is, I think, one of the best acting achievements I've ever seen in my experience. I've got a great idea where we should go next. Oh, I don't want to hear it. Change your mind when I tell you. Shut up. Okay, okay. Your great idea is a goddess. Forget about it. I don't ever want to hear another one of your ideas, all right? All right. Okay. Australia. I figured secretly you wanted to know, so I told you. Australia. That's your great idea. It's the latest in, in a long line. Australia's no better than here. Ah, oh, that's all you know. <coughs> they mean one thing. They, they speak mean one English thing. in Australia. They do? That's right, smart guys, so we wouldn't be foreigners. Got horses in Australia. How they got thousands of miles we could hide out in. A good climate, nice beaches. You could learn to swim. No, swimming isn't important. What about the banks? They're easy. Easy, ripe, and luscious. <laughs> the banks are the women. Well, once you got one, you got the other. It's a long way, though, isn't it? Ah, everything's got to be perfect with you. I just don't want to get there and find out it stinks. That's all. At least think about it. All right. I'll think about it. Hey. When we get outside, when we get to the horses, just remember one thing. Hey, wait a minute. What? You didn't see the fours out there, did you? The fours? No. Oh, good. For a moment, I thought we were in trouble. There are varying stories of their deaths in Bolivia. In fact, some people in Utah, including Butch's sister, who's still alive, say that Butch escaped and made it back to Utah and lived there until a few years ago under an assumed name. On the other hand, the one thing most historians agree about is that a whole company of Bolivian cavalry was brought in at the end to get them and uh, it seems unlikely that either one could have survived that. In fact, I was a little concerned that bringing in this many men just to kill two bandits might be dramatically unbelievable, however historically accurate it was. At the very end of the film, I wanted to take them right up to the point of their being killed and freeze frame and make them a part of a still photograph of the scene in the same uh, sepia color that we used in the New York stills. In order to get this shot, I needed some technical advice, and I flew Bill Abbott down from the studios. Until we go to sepia. Mm-hmm. And? Our problem was that we couldn't put our 35 millimeter motion picture camera up here on the roof and freeze frame because our lenses weren't long enough for a close shot of the guys, and an optical blow-up of them would be too poor quality. So we put an 8 by 10 still camera up here. Then on a direct line toward the door uh, that Paul and Bob run out of, we put a 35 millimeter Panavision camera. First, we made several quick takes of Paul and Bob running out towards camera and shooting. Then we removed the motion picture camera and took a still shot of the whole set with nobody in it. Uh, this had to be done quickly so that the shadows on the closer 35 millimeter shot would match the wider still photograph. Then back at the studio, we froze the 35 millimeter action as they came running out, took this last frozen frame, bled all the color out of it down to a sepia, and pasted it into a blow up of the 8x10 still of the set. 
Then we re-photographed it on an animation board, pulled back to reveal Paul and Bob now as a part of a still photograph of the whole scene. I have now spent exactly a year and three months on this film, and at this point, I don't know yet how it's gonna be received. I think it's a good film, I think the guys are great in it, and I think the relationships work. Uh, it was a hell of a lot of hard work doing it, and actually even more fun. And if the audiences don't take it, I, uh, I think I'll go out of my fucking mind.